Hi, so let's continue from where we stopped. We were discussing the vibrations of a circular membrane which is clamped along the rim and we derived the differential equation for the circular membrane. I gave you a reference to Krasik's book and we did a separation of variables and we got the radial part of the solution VR must satisfy this Bessel's differential equation 5.9 that you see in the slide. And we also saw that the physically tenable solution is Jn of Kr. And since the membrane is clamped on the boundary, that is Jn of K must be 0. So we saw that the K, the relevant K, the parameter K must be a root of the Bessel's function or the zeros of the Bessel's functions. We are going to later prove that the Bessel's function Jn has infinitely many zeros. Now let us assume that n is 0. Let us assume that this function z doesn't depend on the angular coordinates at all. We are only looking at the radial vibrations of the membrane. Now of course if we understand this function a cos ckt plus b sin ckt. This is a function we understand. So it's important to understand this other function jn of kr a little more carefully. So now let us look at the radial vibrations. Now we are given a second order differential equation. So we must give the initial displacement and the initial velocity a membrane. The initial displacement is zx0 and the initial velocity is ztx0. They are the radial functions because we assumed that the n is 0. So cos n theta term will drop out. And so this depends only on root of x squared plus y squared. So solution is simply j naught. Remember n is 0. j naught of kr into a cos ckt plus b sin ckt. k runs through the list of zeros of j naught. Zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3 dot dot dot. The most general solution is a superposition of these things. Namely zrt equal to summation j from 1 to infinity j naught zeta j r correspondingly there will be a j cos c zeta j t plus b j sin c zeta j t. The c is a constant which appears in the wave equation itself. The c does not change and so it is a zeta j that keeps changing and then these coefficients a j's and b j's have to be determined. Now we put t equal to 0 in 5.11. When you put t equal to 0 in 5.11, the sine term disappears and we'll just get a equation for determining a's. We must differentiate with respect to t and then put t equal to 0. This part involving aj will disappear and we'll get an equation determining bj. What are these equations? Let us look at them. Z r0 which is a known function summation j from 1 to infinity a j j naught zeta j r. So left hand side is known and from this equation we have to determine these coefficients a j. Now when you differentiate with respect to time this c zeta j will come out and they will be clubbed with these coefficients a j's and b j's. So after clubbing them I am going to use a different name for these coefficients. So z t of r comma 0. Z t of r comma 0 is a known function, the initial velocity of the wave that is going to be an infinite superposition of j0 zeta j r but the coefficients are c j. The b j has become a c j because when you differentiate we pick up some factors j, c and all these things. To, in order to proceed further, we need a result from analysis, from classical analysis called the Bessel expansion theorem. We are not equipped to prove this general theorem on Bessel's functions. The relevant theorem is available in chapter 18 or the monumental work of G. N. Watson. I already mentioned to you in the past the work of G. N. Watson, Treatise on the Theory of Bessel's Function, the second edition, Cambridge University Press. And you also want to look at the historical introduction 
on page 577 to 579. So using the Bessel expansion theorem, you can determine the AJs and CJs. Let us look at the formula for AJ for example. Suppose if f of r is a smooth function on 0, 1, I am going to assume that the function is smooth, then this function f of r can be expanded as a series of Bessel's function f of r equal to summation j from 1 to infinity a j j naught zeta j r where what are these a j's these a j's are given by equation 5.12 2 by j 1 zeta j squared integral 0 to 1 r f of r j naught zeta j r dr in the chapter 1 we try to write a general function from minus pi to pi as a summation of sines and cosines. Here we are trying to write a general function on 0 to 1, we are assuming it is smooth as a linear combination of j0, zeta, j, r and with certain coefficients and the coefficients are given by equation 5.12. It is exact analog of those coefficients formulas a n equal to 1 upon pi integral minus pi to pi f of t cos n t dt etc. They are analogs for the Fourier Bessel expansion. Okay, so let us proceed further. So now we discuss the orthogonality properties of the Bessel's function. So observe that in this particular expansion you got this j naught zeta 1 r, j naught zeta 2 r, j naught zeta 3 r. So we got an infinite set of functions. These Bessel's functions, remember that the Bessel's function is an entire function, j naught is an entire function and zeta j is a fixed number and so j naught zeta j r is a nice function on the closed interval 0, 1. So now the question is that if I take this family of functions j naught zeta j r and allow the j to run from 1, 2, 3 up to infinity, then we get a sequence of functions in 0, 1. Will that have any kind of orthogonality properties? Will it be orthogonal with respect to L2 of 0, 1? Well, it will be provided you describe the measure properly. It is not the Lebesgue measure, it will be a weighted Lebesgue measure. And so you can talk about L2 of a measure space, right? L2 of a measure space and I can have a sequence of functions and I can ask for orthogonality and completeness of the sequence of functions. Completeness is what the Bessel's expansion theorem talks about. Completeness is difficult and we shall not discuss that. Orthogonality we shall discuss here. So orthogonality with, with respect to the measure R dr. So that is the objective of the next series of 5 or 6 ex exercises. So first thing would be to write the Bessel's equation in self adjoint form. So first of all notice that the Bessel's differential equation is x y double prime plus y prime plus x minus p squared by x y equal to 0. I have taken the standard Bessel's equation x squared y double prime plus x y prime plus x squared minus p squared y equal to 0 and I divided through by x and I get this. Now this first two terms can be combined and it can be written as d d x of x y prime plus x minus p squared by x y equal to 0. This is called the self adjoint form of this differential equation. We shall be writing the self adjoint forms of many of the classical differential equations such as the Legendre equation and the Hermite's equation as well and you will get a hang of it and why is the self adjoint form important. Let us make a change of variables. Let us look at phi u x equal to j p of x u. So let us find out what happens when I use j p x u in the differential equation. What kind of a differential equation do I get? When I make a change of variables x u equal to t. In other words, what is the differential equation satisfied by phi sub u? It is here 5.13. Equation 5.13 is the ODE satisfied by the scaled Bessel's functions at j p x u. Eventually the u will be a 0 of the Bessel's function. Now let us assume that p greater than or equal to 0. So these two exercises of exercise 4 and exercise 5 are routine calculus exercises 
I'll just leave it to you. Exercise 6 is more interesting and we shall dwell a little deeper in exercise 6. So first I'm going to assume p is greater than or equal to 0 because p squared appears and p is real so I may as well assume it's non-negative. Zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3 is a list of zeros of the Bessel's function. Show that the family jp zeta x is orthogonal on the interval 0, 1 with respect to the weight function x. What do I mean by saying with respect to the weight function x? Let us call this phi j of x. So I mean phi j and phi k are orthogonal with respect to the measure x dx. In other words, integral 0 to 1 phi j x phi k x x dx is 0 if j and k are distinct. That's the meaning of saying orthogonality with respect to the weight function x. So let's prove this result which is given as exercise 6. Some easy verifications I will leave it to you to check. Having discussed the orthogonality of the function, we must determine what is the normalizing factor. Remember that when you have c1 phi1 plus c2 phi2 plus c3 phi3 plus dot dot dot, what are the ci's? The ci's are inner product, x inner product with phi i divided by norm phi i squared. What is the measure in the L2 space? x dx is the measure. So what is the norm squared? The norm squared is 5.14 x times jp zeta x the whole square dx. So these are the normalizing factors in the orthogonal system. So we must compute these as well if we want to compute the Fourier coefficients. Okay, so now let us look at the list of exercises a little more and then we'll look at the solutions to some of these exercises. Let zeta be a zero of the Bessel's function and you multiply the Bessel's differential equation by 2x zeta j n prime zeta x and we have to deduce 5.15. The normalizing factors that I talked about in the previous one, we need to compute these integrals and these integrals are computed here in the next exercise. And using this exercise, we deduce the formula of Lommel. What is the formula of Lommel? The formula of Lommel appears in the Bessel expansion theorem here. So in this formula of Lommel, we can determine Aj. Here we are not going to prove the validity of this expansion. What we are going to do is that we are going to assume that this holds and proceed formally with the calculation. That's what I mean when I say prove the formula of Lommel or deduce the formula of Lommel, proceed formally and use the two previous exercises. Then you need the two identities that we derived in chapter 1, the two identities for Bessel's functions. One involving p and the other involving minus p here. And there is a next exercise of expanding x to the power n as a Bessel series. And this I can leave it to you to work out. A very interesting proof of the orthogonality properties of the Bessel's functions suggested by physical considerations. We are going to give an analytical argument for the orthogonality of the Bessel's functions. But the Bessel's functions arise from physics, from vibration problems and so it's of interest to understand does this orthogonality have any physical relevance? Yes it does. In fact we can deduce the orthogonality from physical considerations. And for this, you should definitely look at the two volumes of Lord Rayleigh, Theory of Sound. It is an amazing two volume work. It contains lots of information about various aspects of the theory of vibrations. It is difficult to find many of these things in other standard texts. I've given you a complete reference to it with the page numbers to the uh, relevant orthogonality property derived from physical considerations. Now let us prove this orthogonality that I talked about using mathematics, using analysis. So let us fix P and let us look at the list of zeros of the Bessel's functions. Now these zeros are simple zeros. So if I have a function f of x, remember that our Bessel's functions are entire functions. And for an entire function, when you have a zero of an entire function, you understand what does it mean to say that a zero is a simple zero. 
Why can't it be a double zero, for example? Suppose, for example, if zeta 1 were to be a double zero of jp, let us arrive at a contradiction. That means what? jp zeta is zero, jp prime zeta is also zero. And zeta is not zero. These are the non-zero roots of the Bessel's function. If I take p positive, if p is 3, for instance, we know that jpz is z cube times a power series with a non-zero constant. So the origin is definitely a zero of the Bessel's function if p is positive. But that's not what we're talking about. This In this list, zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3, none of the zetas are zero. We're looking at the non-zero zeros of the Bessel's function, if you like. So why is it that these zeros are simple? If it were not simple, if it were a double zero, for example, or a triple zero, then both the function and its derivative will vanish. But JP satisfies an ODE, which is of second order. And I can divide by the leading coefficient x squared because I'm looking at the point where it is not zero. And the uniqueness clause in the fundamental existence uniqueness theorem of ODEs will tell you why this cannot happen. If that happens, then JP will be identically zero. So the zeros are simple. So, and let us write them in ascending order. The zeros are real. The JP doesn't have any complex zeros. So let us write phi jx as JP of zeta jx. Now again, a routine calculation will tell you that this phi j satisfies this ODE. It is just that the x squared gets replaced by x squared zeta j squared. Nothing else happens in the differential equation. First, we will look at the case when p is strictly positive and later we'll look at what happens when p is zero. The case p is zero is easier. The k p bigger than zero is slightly more complicated, but that's also pretty easy really. Multiply the differential equation by one upon x phi k x. So this phi j, phi k, and there's an x here after multiplication by x inverse because one x inverse will cancel with the one x here will be left with one x. So that's the idea. So multiply the differential equation by one upon x phi k x and integrate over zero one. The question that I want to ask you is why is this an integrable function? See phi k x upon x, is it integrable over zero one? Again, remember that since p is positive and phi k x is cooked up out of a Bessel's function, j p x behaves like x to the power p. So when I divide by x, I'm going to get 1 upon x to the power 1 minus p. That's certainly an integrable function. So the 1 upon x is not going to cause any problems as far as integrability is concerned. So this is integrable. So what happens to the differential equation? Integral 0 to 1 phi k d d x of x phi j prime x because one x cancelled out plus the middle term zeta j squared x phi j x phi k x minus the last term p squared integral 0 to 1 phi j x phi k x dx by x equal to 0. All right, what we are going to do now is we are going to perform an integration by parts in the first term. When you perform an integration by parts in the first piece, the derivative will shift to the other factor and we'll pick up a minus sign. So you'll get a minus sign. So minus integral 0 to 1 x phi k prime x phi j prime x dx plus the zeta squared integral 0 to 1 x phi j x phi k x dx. I've not done anything to the second integral and the third integral. What we're going to do is we're going to switch the roles of j and k and you're going to subtract the two things. So the term involving p squared will cancel out and the first term will also cancel out. This minus integral 0 to 1 x phi k prime phi j prime that will also cancel out. What we will be left with is the middle term zeta j squared minus zeta k squared integral 0 to 1 x phi j x phi k x dx equal to 0. Now remember that zeta j and zeta k are distinct zeros and so that cancels out and we are left with the orthogonality condition 0 to 1 integral x phi j x phi k x dx equal to 0 as advertised. 
There's one small thing though. Something is written in red in the slide. Explain why the boundary terms will drop out. When you do an integration by parts, you're going to get a boundary term. Let us examine the boundary term. What will be the boundary term? At 0 and at 1. Of course, the presence of x here means that when x equal to 0, the thing will drop out. At the other end of the boundary, phi k1. What is phi k1 or phi j1? Phi k1 will be jp zeta k. Remember that zeta k is a 0 of the Bessel's function. So jp of zeta k will be 0. So the boundary terms cancel out. The boundary terms drop out. So there are no boundary terms to worry about. And so the orthogonality of phi j and phi k has been established for p positive. What about the case when p is 0? When p is 0, the situation is much easier because the third term in the differential equation is not there and the x drops out, one factor of x drops out of the differential equation and the differential equation simplifies to x phi j prime prime plus x zeta j squared phi j x is 0. The differential equation simplifies. Now the same technique will work again. You again multiply by phi k x and integrate by parts over 0, 1 and the rest of the argument is completely similar to the previous argument. And since this part is easier than the previous one, I can safely leave it to you as an exercise. So we see here that from the point of view of vibration theory of a circular membrane, we have obtained a remarkable family of orthogonal functions. We take a, the Bessel's function jpx and we take its zeros, zeta1, zeta2, zeta3, etc. jp zeta kx, where k runs from 1 to infinity, that gives you an infinite family of mutually orthogonal system of functions, orthogonal with respect to which weighting function? x dx, that's the measure. So, L2 of 0, 1 with respect to the measure x dx. In that Hilbert space, we got a complete orthonormal basis. But we are not proved completeness. Completeness is difficult to establish. We will not do that. And we will just leave this over here. Other exercises I will discuss in the next capsule. The second exercise that we talked about this deriving 5.15 is more tricky and we will do that in the next capsule. I think this is a very good place to stop this lecture here. Thank you very much.